And joining us today is Kadlejo from the great YouTube channel, Citizen Concerns. It popped up on my timeline a few weeks ago, and I've been watched all of the videos on Citizen Concerned. Kadlejo is here with us. What on earth are you trying to do with your life in terms of trying to irritate the comrades of South Africa? <laughs> do you have a death wish? That was not my intention. That was absolutely not my intention. It happened. It, it happened. I didn't wish for it to happen, but yeah, here we are. Uh, what I wanted to do was just be a concerned citizen and share what I think all other concerned citizens should care about, the things that should be on our minds, uh, things that we need to interrogate and be aware of. So that was the intention, really. I actually started this channel three years ago. I know it's only starting like to gain traction now. I started three years ago and it was just meant to speak about the things that I was like, Hmm, are people thinking about this? Are citizens seeing this? You know, we did like a few videos, like four videos, and I put that on pause. And then I went to my other channel, which is mainly a faith based channel. I just do Christian content there, encourage people, you know, on matters of God. And recently, like this year, I was like, no, man, we need to talk about this. I was like, politics, not so much. I don't really want to be so much on politics, but with everything that is happening, whether you like it or not, whether you are into politics or not, the reality is that we are affected by politics. I was like, I'm not just going to sit and talk about it with my family and complain with my colleagues, but I'm going to do my bit. And that's what I'm doing. Yeah, so as you may know, there is in the old adage, which is you may not care about politics, but unfortunately, politics cares yeah, about you. you. So it's not something that you can ignore. Yeah. With that being said, just use our own stats. This isn't a flex. It's just our stats. So we've got about 15 million views and you've got around 300,000 views. And you've managed to do something so far with your 300,000 views that we haven't done with 14 million views. And that is you've been directly attacked by the EFF <laughs> twice. They've actually issued whole documentaries on you about how you're apparently a... a prostitute from somewhere around Joburg and stuff. Uh, I watch that with great, great amusement. So congratulations. Your annoyance of the comrades has been so severe that they've already struck back. Like, how did that make you feel? Um, so it happened. Like I was at work and someone sent me that and I was like, oh, what is that? And I was like, man, you know, I just started feeling weird about it. And I was like, I'm not going to open this now because I don't want it to mess up my day. Then I sent it to my husband and I still didn't open uh, Twitter. When I got home, he was like, okay, let's go through it together. He had looked at some of the comments already. And then it was like, huh, huh, like people really do this, eh? Like I, I would have been, I don't know, more understanding if they went into my life and they found something that's true, something that speaks to, you know, uh, my channel, like maybe I'm lying, I'm doing something. I was like, Okay, if they had done that, that's something else. But now they went, and the picture that that lady got is actually an old uh, picture of mine. I was at my mom's house like years ago. So basically, she went through my Facebook, and she found a picture, and it, it didn't even reflect prostitution. But I was like, really, guys? Is this how low you can go? Is this how low you really want to go? Uh, but after looking at it, I was like, actually, it means I need to go further. It means I need to go harder. It means I need to do more. The fact that this is how they're going when I'm only starting, it means, yeah, I'm on the right track. So, so tell me a little bit about like your, your ideas about the world. So you do say that you have a second channel based on, on faith-based content, notably around God. I assume the Christian God, uh, yes, for lack of a better yes. term. When, when, you, when you look at the world and you want the world to reflect your values, what so, are sorry, values? Sorry, I'm just going to interrupt there and obviously, you know, annoy half our audience and say, obviously the true God, right? So, yes, you, you know, you, you're obviously believing in the true God, the one true God, the only God. Yes, the way the truth is. I, I just wanted to confirm. I just wanted, I just wanted to confirm because you know Ramon can come across as a bit of a heretic. Don't worry, we'll we'll burn him afterwards. It's all good. <laughs> uh, it's already been done before. Got the scars, so yeah, I'm used to it. Anyway, my question was, what is the world uh, according to your values? What does that world look like? What are your values? Okay, so. There's a world that I'd like to see and there's a world that we are seeing 
right, right now, and the world that I would like to see is the one of me loving myself just as I love my neighbor and my neighbor loving me the way that they love themselves. And unfortunately, I find that that is not how we live. Um, even myself as a Christian, it's not always easy to do that, right? It's not always easy to be humble, to be patient, to be kind, to be selfless. But that is what I believe we should always be aspiring towards as we get into our cars, get into the taxi, going to work, dealing with our children, dealing with whoever. That is how we ought to be thinking, right? Thinking of loving the next person the way we love ourselves. And the reality currently is that that's not how we're doing things. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if that answers your question. Yeah, but to a large degree, that's exactly what it means to be a Christian, right? So, I mean, the fundamental point is that everybody will see you fail as a Christian and then go, oh, look, isn't that, that's very non-Christianly, is it? Like, look, you, you were angry. You, you did something wrong. You, you cheated, you lied, you steal, mm. or you stole, right? That, the fundamental problem is that people don't understand the mere nature of Christianity, as I'm sure you know. Mm. The nature of Christianity is that Jesus gives an ideal. Mm. He tells you this is how you should do things. And then he says, by the way, you're going to fail. Yep. You're going to fail hard, but that's okay because I've redeemed your sins. Therefore, it's okay for you to fail. Yeah. I expect you to fail, mm. but when you do fail, get up and try again. But okay. by the way, when you do get up and try again, you're going to fail and that's okay because I've redeemed your sins. So just mm. keep trying. And by trying, you can eventually achieve betterment of, well, everything. So what you, what you're describing there. The want of a you know a better world, the fact that it's not there, that's ideal. But I think in South Africa, what we're seeing is that, to a large degree, even in our political environment, the politicians don't want you to ascribe for betterment. What they want you to do is they want you to ascribe to a standard that they feel everybody's capable of obtaining. And the standard is very low, yeah, like really low. In which case, why bother trying? And I think that's that's the fundamental difference between probably your ethics of what you want to see achieved and where we are now. Yeah. Would you agree? Yes, I would. And I think that is how even as a society regarding politics, we have become so relaxed. You know, it's like the, the standard is low, like you said, like people are stealing from us. People are messing up our country. People are, you know, oppressing the, the poorest of the poor, you know. And we are, we're like, okay, man, like, what, what can I do? What can I do? Uh, even me with my channel right now, like I have people, close people who are like, yeah, you're talking about that, but really what's going to happen? Nothing's going to happen. Uh, it's, it's always be like this. This is how we live and this is how we've lived and this is how we are yet to live. And I think that low standard has gotten us to a place of losing hope. It has gotten us to a place of accepting th things that should not be accepted. It has gotten us to a place of relaxing when we ought to be, you know, engaging, um, not saying fighting, but like engage with truth, engage with facts, engage with, you know, interactions with each other and say, this is wrong. Call out the banks, call out the politicians, call out the public and private sector on the things that they're doing. Um, so, yeah, the standard definitely is low. The 30 percent that we are seeing in schools, it's it's not just in schools. It's a, it's a trend and a standard that is low across the board, really. Yeah. No, it really is. You, you can you can feel the mediocrity creeping into all sorts of of, of paradigms uh, in our in our daily lives. Even like even to get like a qualified artisan to help you fix something. Like it's difficult to find one that doesn't screw you over or that is on time or you know something like that. I'm dealing with contractors at a, a place that I'm renovating, and I've been blessed so far, but I've been let down quite a lot by just the sheer mediocrity. People say they got no jobs. You offer them one, and then they don't get there on time or they make any excuse not to do it and it, it, it really is like a, a sort of a, a lowering of standards for ourselves as a people mm. and i don't know how we're going to get rid of that without some form of overt strong world leader not necessarily through democratic means mm. they can take this country by the scruff of its neck and say this is the way forward you either come with me or get out of the way very similar to what they did in um, 
what they're currently doing in Argentina and what they did in El Salvador. There's a, a president who sort of solves crime in a year oh. using special powers. Like, I think South Africa is at that stage where we need someone really special to step up to the plate. But I don't think we're going to get one because everyone is relatively mediocre. I think, I think yeah, there are really good people. to stand people. up to the plate. There are. We there. We are there. Um, I think we're full of fear. I think we think we can't do it. I think we look down on ourselves. I think just the common citizen, most of us, look down on ourselves. We look down on the power that we have. And for that reason, even that the highest standard that we may hold, we don't think it's possible. We don't think that we can make a difference. We have been conditioned in such a way that we think what the poli- what the politician says and does, that's what goes. And if they said that, if the standard is that low, then who, who are we to do anything? And I think that's where it starts. We need to start understanding that it's not who are we to not to do something, it's who are we to not do something? This is our money. This is our country. This is our future, our hospitals, our children, our everything. You know, the politicians can cannot do anything without us. The very salary that they have, it's because of us. If we didn't pay the taxes, you know, nothing would happen. So I think it's understanding the power that we have. I'm going to do it through my YouTube channel. You guys are doing it through your YouTube channel. There's somebody else who's a lawyer who can do it in that space. There's somebody else who's, you know, a politician who can do it in that space. And I think it's us understanding that we do hold the power and that can help us understand that there is hope. That's what I think. Everyone has a role to play, but we just don't think our role is big enough. So the biggest difficulty is kind of coming back to even what I was saying. So the the difficulty is that in... It, let's take, for example, the 17th century foundational idea of a developmental state or a, a building of a state, right? So everybody builds a state based on the idea. You know, Thomas Thomas, uh, Thomas Aquinas and uh, St. Augustus used to write about it. They talked about it as the two cities. You have the city, kingdom of heaven, you have the city on earth, and you try to create on earth a heavenly kingdom that would kind of replicate what you think heaven would look like, and you ascribe or you aspire for greatness, knowing that you're never quite going to achieve greatness, but you can try. Mm-hmm. And so you see this even in a lot of Western architecture, right? It's a lot of Western architecture, historical architecture. Buildings are very pretty. They're very aspirational. They're very, you know, they're very nice to look at. And think Notre Dame in, in Paris, for example. Mm-hmm. The problem is that in the modern state, when you take out the idea of ascribing for the divan, then you have to ascribe for what is. And then you get like what you typically refer to as a, you know, the material state. So now I have to look to somebody to ascribe to, because that's who we are as people. People always, you know, there's the old saying, which I suppose now would be classed as racist, but the old saying is "monkey see, monkey do," and there's oh. it's, it's a reason. It's it's a saying for a reason, and that's because people always look to a motivator or a something to ascribe themselves to in order mm-hmm. to be aspirational. Mm-hmm. What is now aspirational is the state. Mm-hmm. And so everybody ascribes themselves to the state. So if you think about it, what do we do? We look to our leaders, right? And certainly that's what the ANC tells us. You don't look to God because the ANC is to a large degree a communist party. And as Karl Marx once said in communism, Religion is the opium of the masses. He's like he doesn't believe that communists should be faith-based people, which is always funny when you hear the communists talk about religion because you're like, this is this is not compatible with your movement. But anyway, that's a different conversation. But the point the point then becomes that if you get people to look at the state, the state is so fundamentally flawed and fallen that is it any wonder that everybody else looks to the very leaders that they're told to look to, and they mimic them. So in the scenario of Ramon, you like you have a contract that he steals your cash. Mm. But it's not surprising, right? I mean, freaking leaders are stealing the cash. Why aren't you stealing the cash? Mm. The guy gets paid. He, and let's take it in, leader, in leadership positions. The guy gets paid, buys a new car. Mm. Ramon pays a contractor, buys a new car. Mm. Right? Because that's, that's what they're they ascribed to. That's the role model. And unfortunately, it becomes very difficult to break that paradigm without breaking the state. Because you almost have to take the state and destroy it. So you've got two ways to do that. The first would be aspirational, which we've just said. You could do it on like the old Augustan theory of two cities. I don't think that's going to work in South Africa. I don't think that kind of like 
fifth century theological thinking is going to make everybody be better. The second option is you need a really strong world Caesar who's prepared to come in and destroy everything by force. And once he's destroyed everything by force, you have to do what Gator McKenzie once said to us. You have to pray. You get a, you get a Bukele and you don't get a Robert Mugabe, but there's no guarantee. And that's the problem. So let's assume in South Africa that that leader came in here and he destroyed everything. In your, in your opinion, who have we got in South African politics that would be capable of, one, destroying the state, and two, rebuilding it in some, into something that's grand? Anyone? Okay. Okay, so I think I need to make a disclaimer before I answer that. Uh, like I said, I thought politician, uh, politics rather is not my thing. I'm not affected by politics. I don't care about politics until recently. So I want everyone to understand that I don't know everything and I don't claim to know everything regarding politics. Uh, but with the little knowledge that I do have, with the little research that I ha have done thus far, I think I'm going to have to go with Herman Mashaba. That's the one person in politics currently. Don't make a face. Don't make a face. <laughs> it is my right. <laughs> so currently, that's the one person that I'm actually saying, okay, as I look at what he says and what he has done thus far, that's the one person that I think, okay, maybe him. ANC, definitely no for me. Uh, EFF, definitely no for me. Uh, DA at this stage, I'm like, I'm not sure. Okay, um, Gaten McKenzie and his team, it's a no for me at this stage, and I might be wrong. And I think we need to also understand, yes, for 2024 elections, these are the people that we have and others that I've not mentioned, um, but we should not give up by simply looking at the politicians that we currently have right now. Um, in the next election, we might have somebody else that does fit, the, somebody else that can do what we need them to do. And, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful, I'm prayerful, and I'm, I'm, I'm praying for a better South Africa, and I believe that it can happen. It is possible. Herman might, Shaba might not be the person, but for me at this stage, that's who I'm looking at. And, yeah. Ultimately, I'm looking at God and I'm praying to say, hey, man, God, you know who's best here and you know who's lying. So help us to vote right next year because I'm like at a place where I'm like, maybe him and my job is going to get my vote. Maybe not. Um, yeah, that's where I'm at. That's what I think. What do you guys think? Yeah, I mean, uh, her Mashab, I love is, I mean, Kadekhoro, it's lovely to have you on the show. Thank you for joining us. Um, <laughs> yeah, not too much more to say. <laughs> We had such high expectations, my goodness. You, um, you, you, know, <laughs> you know, you know, what you're doing right now is what they're doing to me on Twitter. Just because you don't agree with me doesn't mean you shouldn't continue the conversation with me. I know, it's a joke. We have fun on this channel. Um, <laughs> so no, we, 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 we dislike her, Mashaba, quite a lot. Uh, oh, due to, because we actually know, because we know him. <laughs> That's the problem. Oh, Okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, we just find him wildly ineffect ineffective. Um, but uh, for, for now, we don't we don't have a, a Caesar. Like we don't think there is one currently in in, in the crop. We have mm -hmm. issues with a lot of people. Mm -hmm. The closest one is maybe either Cornet Mulder from the Free Run Plus or Kenneth Meshway from the ACDP, mm -hmm. because they are always correct about everything. Mm -hmm. Strategically, tactically, they lacking in some senses. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the right way of thinking. They mm -hmm. have definitely got it. So that, okay. that would be my two choices. Okay. Byron, what about you? And don't say Helen Zilla, please. We know you love her. Uh, yeah, I actually have a picture of Helen Zilla on my wall with Ramon. So <laughs> let the hate in the comments begin. Uh, yeah, I, I think I think Julius. Like, Julius is my boy. No, I'm just kidding. Um I don't, I don't know because you see the problem that I have in South Africa is that we spend time with probably every major politician out there, so we kind of know a lot more about them than we should. And I suppose okay. for me, it, it's only really one guy that I can say I've I've interviewed and I've spent time with, and I'm like, I like this guy, and that's probably Kenneth Mishra. 
there's there's very okay. few politicians where I can like say I've just thrown out stuff at him and be like, what do you think of this? And he's like, all right, all right. And he's like, he's got a real proper answer for it. And he's quite passionate uh-huh. with his answers. And it's like, in my opinion, the guy's very clued up. The only other politician would be, and again, I'm looking forward to the hate comments uh, below, but probably Gaten. G- Gaten has all the right instincts. Gaten McKenzie has all the right instincts when it comes through to politics. Uh-huh. But... The PA is like the DA, but for colored people. So it's it's limited itself so far, but in its appeal to a certain demographic. I, I think the biggest challenge Gateson's going to have, especially in next year's election, is to make his party appealable to a wider audience. A, a little bit like the DA, really. I mean, you know, the DA is considered, even though the vast majority of voters, by the way, for the DA are not actually white. And the vast majority of their leadership positions are not white. It's still considered a, a white party. And it's it's kind of not. But for me, yeah, those are probably my two picks. So Kenneth Mushier of the ACDP and probably Gates and other BA. Okay. And why why are you guys against him and Mashaba? Like I said, I don't know a lot about everyone. Uh, I know what I've researched. So we just we tell both, me that... So we both we both re- interviewed him. Uh-huh. Um, last year was it last year or more, or was it 2021? I don't know uh, one of the years. They're both. We had three interviews. And they all sound like the same one, so it's difficult to tell. But the last interview we did, uh, I, I did with Herman, and half <laughs> a sizable amount of his party members resigned after the interview. <laughs> there was like in the press and everything. They were like, "Ah, he did this interview with me," and they're like, "They all left." But we also did a follow-up, uh, like a, just a discussion between Ramon and myself afterwards. The problem that I found with Herman at the time, look, I really wanted to like Herman Mashaba, but I found that a lot of the questions that I was asking him around actual policy yeah. were kind of like not very well thought out. Okay. The you would ask him questions like, okay, what's your position on, let's say, for example, gun legislation? Do you want people to be able to own a firearm for the purpose of self-defense? And he was like, ah, oh, well, you know, I want a country where we reintroduce God into the schools. And, you know, when God's back in the schools, we'll have good discipline. And it's like, you're not answering the question, dude. Like, mm. the, answer, the question was very, was very definitive. Yeah. Mm. So it was a very, it was a very frustrating interview of an hour and a half of, Basically, the only policy that he actually had, and Ramon and I discussed it afterwards, and possibly it's the most important policy in politics. Mm-hmm. You could you could view it like that. But his major policy, the only policy he could actually flesh out was he just wants to remove the ANC from government. Kind of everything after that is just kind of like, ah, oh, we'll cross that bridge later when we get there. But that's mm-hmm. that leads you to a lot of problems because... Once you remove somebody, you have to fill the vacuum. And if you don't have the ideas to fill the vacuum, someone else will. Uh So a good example of that is we are, I think the final question we asked him is, would you partner with the EFF? And he says, well, he wouldn't not partner with anybody who would help him remove the ANC because that's his policy. He wants to remove it. It's like, okay. But if you don't have a land policy and the EFF does, and you partner with them, you realize that your land policy will be the EFFs because they yeah. have something you don't. They actually have yeah. a policy. And that's that was the frustration. Now, bear in mind, this may have been 18 months ago, maybe two years ago. Maybe things have changed. I mean, I doubt it, but maybe they've changed. Mm. So, but it, after the interview, Ramon and I were both a bit like, I we wanted I to like the guy, watch, but... I need to go watch those interviews. But also, he, he committed the cardinal sin for me, Kadejo. So when he left the DA, he, oh. he went straight into racist mode, right? All the usual tropes about it. And we don't hold water for the DA, right, uh-huh, um, uh-huh. at all. Um, and as soon as he, he he left the DA, he immediately went on the, the you know, Helen Zillers are racist, oh. and the DA is for, for white racist, and this racist, and this racist. It was like a typical ANC kind of line there's no vision there's no strategy it's just pure reaction from Mm -hmm. Herma Shaba on a lot of things and that's why we don't think he's worth worth much uh, in our particular opinion and even now his strategy is to like 
cut the DA at the knees rather than just cut the ANC down. All he's, all of, all of, even now before the election, he is campaigning in areas governed by the DA, not in the townships governed by the ANC. Oh, okay. Like it's just okay. dumb. Uh, so yeah, basically we just don't think he's very smart, essentially. Okay. No. Problem. But you see, the, prob- the problem inevitably comes in order to campaign in the areas where the ANC governs, you need to recruit from the areas that the ANC governs. And the areas that the ANC governs, not really that nice, right? And the people that are there are sometimes less than uh, squeaky clean. So what Herman does is because he's a, what I would describe to you as a city dweller, you know, he'll sit there and basically go after the city dweller. Well, the Karen in the Western Cape, guess what, man? She, she'd never been to a township. She don't know what they look like. She'd never seen the inside of a, sh- a shack. And asking her to go campaign in Kadisha, it's not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. So what he ends up doing is he goes after all of like the kind of local councillors and the support people. He goes after the exact same people that the DA go after. It's like, okay, so you're having the DA's vote mm-hmm. and you're giving yourself some of it and then you're going to give yourself a pat on the back. But, and then you're going to wonder why when you get to 2024, the ANC support base hasn't changed much. It's still roughly the same. Mm-hmm. The ANC gets its support from the rural areas and the townships. Where are you? Are you in those areas? Are you fielding candidates in those areas? And the answer is no. So then you have to ask yourself, well, what's the point of that? Like, I'd much rather support, for me personally, I'd much rather support the IFP because at least the IFP goes into those areas. They actually go after the ANC's voters. And they go after the ANC's voters very hard. Uh, you know, they, the IFP struck up a deal with the DA and they basically said, we'll stay out of your areas, you stay out of ours. And like, together we'll grow a good base and we can cut the ANC at the knees. That's smart. Mm. Is that because the ANC love the DA? Oh, sorry, the IFP love IFP. the DA. No. You know, that, it's, not that they love the, it's not that they love the DA and they're like, oh, yeah, we love John. It's just mm-hmm. smart because their policy is the same as Herman's. Like, you want to you want to govern, you want to kick the ANC out, this is how you do it. Mm-hmm. So it's just for us, the entire approach for, for Action SA and Herman Mashaba's party, we don't feel it. And you're welcome to d- disagree, and hopefully we're wrong. I really hope we're wrong. Mm-hmm. But we just don't feel it has what it takes to be to be the actual next leading opposition or even the leading party in South Africa. Okay. And Herman Mashaba doesn't have enough of a political framework to encourage people who actually listen to vote for him. Mm-hmm. Outside of we just don't want the ANC. I hate to say it. But Juju articulates his policies better than Herman does. He does. He does. Okay, his policies are all fictional and bullshit. Yeah, I agree. But mm. that that's a problem. If you want to if you want to run the country, you need to be a better speaker than Juju. Is Herman a better speaker than Juju? No. Okay. So from that, my thing is like, okay, I have homework. That's to check out Herman Mashaba policies and everything and do a video on that with the facts that I come up with. Uh, but secondly, on your point of speaking, I know that speaking is very important uh, for all political leaders. Um, but my thing is, what is better to have somebody great at speaking, but speaking things that are not achievable, things that are destructive, things that are not honest and truthful, or have somebody who's not a great speaker, but what they stand for is true and is right and it, it can be achieved, you know? Uh, but again, from what you're saying, you're saying what he stands for is not even clear. So that's what I need to go and check out uh, beyond his inability to speak as well as Julius Malema. But yeah, what do you guys think about that, about being a good speaker or not a good speaker? So, so I think it's a bit of a, a sort of a false binary. So for, for me, Julius Malema is the best speaker we have in this country uh, on, yep. based on the worst ideas, right? And the worst part is he doesn't even believe his own ideas. Like, I know people who are around him. Like, everyone is white. His accountant is white. His lawyer is white. His head of security is white. The people that fix his house or Adrian Mazzotti's house where he lives, they are white. Like, everyone he trusts to, like, do stuff for him are white people. So he's not... This this racism thing he does in public, it's really nonsense for the most part. It really is nonsense. And, And we don't give it much credence but we do like the fact that other people take it very seriously and try to cut him down such as afroforum because we don't want that sort of rhetoric in this country we are nationalist in a non-racial way we don't want 
uh, we're not ethnic nationalists in, in, in that way. But it would be very nice to have someone who has Julius Malema's arrogance mm -hmm. to speak like we do mm. and be unapologetic about it. And mm -hmm. for now, we are lacking that person, I feel. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. We are, but the next election, yeah. not, not 2024, but the other election, maybe we might have someone. Who knows? Who knows? We'll see. 2024 is unlikely to change the political landscape. All the data showing us. There will be a realignment of some variety, but it's not likely to be so catastrophic that the entire political landscape is unrecognizable. Mm -hmm. I don't think all the data is telling us that that's not really where it's going to be. The political realignment, if you will, is going to be 2029. Come 2029, the ANC is a footnote in history and everything's up for grabs. I and mean, what happens after that? Don't know. But a lot of, obviously, the political commentators and the political analysts have the same commentary, and that is, will there even be anything left to salvage after 2029? Don't know. Can't comment that. It's actually a really interesting question uh, I'd love to hear your take on is, Roman and I talk about this all the time, but obviously mass immigration out of South Africa is quite a thing, right? You must, you must know people yourself that have uh, left and gone to, I don't know, somewhere else in the world. Mm. What's, what's, your, what's your views on immigration? Well, first of all, not everyone can afford to do that. Um, so so it's, it's sad for the bulk of, you know, most of us. We can't afford to do that. But I think it also is a blessing in disguise, you know, how – we can't just keep running away. We can't just keep leaving, you know, like you leave South Africa, you go to another country. And it's like, for example, people left Zimbabwe and they came to South Africa, right? Not saying they shouldn't have left, but they've left Zimbabwe because it was terrible. Now they've come to South Africa. Some of the people, sorry, please edit that out. Okay. So people have left Zimbabwe to come to South Africa and, um, in hopes to say, okay, we're going to a better country. They're now in South Africa and a lot of bad stuff is happening in South Africa and they're leaving South Africa to go to UK, to go to Australia, to New Zealand. So are we always going to be running away? Are we always going to be, you know, going for the next best thing? And I don't, I don't entirely blame the people that are leaving, but I'm saying we can't keep on running. We need to say, okay, what is making us want to leave and what can we do about it? And I know it's not an ABC type of thing. It's not an easy thing that you, me, uh, Byron and Roman can, can, can change South Africa, but I think we can't just keep running. We can't just keep running. We need to do something. And I'm trying to do my tiny bit in this something. And I believe you guys are doing the same. And different people with different pockets, with different qualifications, different abilities also need to do the same. That's my opinion. So we have a theory on the show that South Africa is 30 years ahead of, of most of, especially Western Europe, but also America. So 30 years ago, we had this uh, democratic change. The first 10 years were okay in terms of economic growth, but the, the policy started to seep into the social ether and they cascaded into what we have now. So in America now, they're having so almost K deployment and, you know, BEE for the most part, mm -hmm. especially in the federal workforce. In Britain, they're looking at diversity quotas for every aspect of, of human life. Uh, in France, there's mass immigration from people who aren't European. All of these issues are essentially what South Africa has gone through in the past 30 years or so. And the difference is the South African government is retarded. Excuse my language. We like to use the term retardanistan to refer to South Africa. But we are used to the chaos and the anarchy and the degradation of the state. In other areas of the world, they are not used to that at all. And those governments can enforce these terrible policies at a much more effective rate than the ANC can. So the blessing in disguise is we are run by commies with terrible policies, but they are so incompetent that it leaves us a lot of space to thwart them. So therefore, South Africa is a better place to be in than most of the rest of the world. What are, you, what is your, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I agree. It's like um, what has been happening, you know, 
what like just like what you said the the social stuff that we're seeing happening in America the power that the government is 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 having and the ability to control people how they raise their children what schools they take their children to and all of that type of thing while here in South Africa due to the incompetence of our government which just shows that you know there's a blessing in everything there's a silver lining in everything their incompetence makes it easier for us to you know, to point out their, their nonsense. It makes it easier for us to take the necessary action. And it goes back to what I said earlier. We as a citizens have so much power, we just don't know how much power we do have. And yeah, like what you're going to do when you get to France and they do, you know, they do what they want to do. They do stuff that is against the citizens and the immigrants there. You don't have much power. You're not even a citizen. But even if you are, how much power do you have? So I think South Africa is a better mess to be in that's what i think yeah yeah so we'd agree with you so our general take on that is obviously as a state it's all right but you need to you need to be state independent so you need to figure out all the different aspects of your life that mm. you could theoretically rely on the state for and make yourself right. independent of the state good example of that's private security i'm sure you've got private security in your house you wouldn't call saps if you can afford to do it, I appreciate yeah. not everybody can afford to, you know, if you, if you can't afford to buy a gun, cause then you've got your own first responder. If you yeah. struggling with electricity because of load shedding, get a generator or go off grid and get solar. Again, I appreciate that there's economic aspects of that. And some people can't afford it, but you do what you can to make yourself independent of the state. Many parts around the world, you can't. Because you're actually prohibited from doing that. You have to rely on the state whether you want to or not. Mm. Which actually comes on to another really interesting topic, I suppose. Get your thoughts on it. And that is around, I'm sure you've seen the news. They just passed an HR. They have put it through the uh, National Council of Provinces. Got Parliament's blessing. It's now got to go to Squirrel's desk. And uh, Ramaphosa is going to have to go out there and decide whether or not he's going to sign it. And we all know he's going to because it's free money for the comrades, right? Comrades are going to have this endless pot. And they're like, oh, this is great. We can steal to our heart's content. It's going to be like the road accident fund all over again. But that's a bargaining chip with people's health. It's one thing to, you know, do a bargaining chip with the road where all I've got to do is just buy myself some new tires. Mm. But when it's the ability for grandma to get a cancer treatment, it's a little bit different, huh? Mm. What's your view on the old NHR debacle? I think it's terrible. Like uh, one of our first videos following the, um, the fires in the buildings in Joburg and Hillbrow, we did one about healthcare and how the government is killing people through healthcare. Personally, I have experience from the public hospital, and I'm not saying all public hospitals are terrible. My firstborn was... Um, born in a public hospital and it was excellent. The second one was awful. It was terrible. We didn't have a place to sleep. I was meant to do a C-section on a certain day at a certain time. It didn't happen. And I can't blame the people, the, the hospital staff, but I can blame the government and what they have done and have failed to do. Now, if you are saying that that's my only option, you don't want me to, if I have the ability to go to a private hospital, you know, go to a private midwife and that, that is you being... First of all, you've messed up what is there and then you want to take away my power to do what I can with my resources. Like, I feel like that is so, it's beyond selfish. It's beyond, it's crazy. It's crazy because healthcare, like you said, healthcare is, is, is more serious than, you know, the police is more serious than the roads is more serious than everything else. And it's so unfair that they're not satisfied with the money that they're stealing now, that they are willing to jeopardize our health for that. They're already doing it. You know, like in the Eastern Cape, there are people who have to go walk so far to go to the clinics that most of the girls are being raped. All the women are being raped. Not all, most of the women are being raped when they come back from the clinics. 
And now you want every single person to be subjected to that incompetence, to be subjected to that mess simply because you want more money. Like how selfish can you be? And that is why I'm so irritated by people who watch the videos and say I'm against black people. The people that you're voting for, the people that I'm trying to expose to you are the people that are against the black people. Because whether we like it or not, a lot of white people are able to afford their own things, to afford their own health care. We are the people that are suffering the most and this fly is so annoying please edit that out thank you very much <laughs> but yeah so it's so yeah yeah i think you can you can stop it there when you're editing uh, 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 maybe i won't edit we'll see <laughs> it's fine this is a human conversation but yes it is, is a human conversation. yes it you is you know we we just uh yeah do do what we want yeah but what are the people saying in your in your sort of neck of the woods your colleagues your neighbors your family so listen i mean i'm half french half arab byron is in the eastern cape somewhere i'm in johannesburg you are somewhere in Gauteng. i'm not going to dox you by any means we, we have different circles of influence just different circles of friends i vaguely know what byron's friends think uh, he knows what my friends and my circle thinks. What are your circle of influence, your friends, your family? It's your friends? very easy to understand what Ramon's uh, friends think. You don't have any. So it's like... Oh, you want to talk? Yeah, I don't want to get personal, but anyway. Anyway, thanks for that, Byron. Who needs enemies? When I have, well, I thought you were my friend. Not, not anymore. But I yeah, I'm his only friend. So it's like, it's easy to figure out what his friends think. I just go, what do I think about this? Like... <laughs> well, I had yeah. a serious, yeah, I'm going to edit all of this out because I had a serious question and now you're fucking around making me look sh bad for not having any friends but anyway you are the star of the show what do your friends think all two of them or more hopefully <laughs> I actually don't have a lot of friends um, but yeah the people that are in my circle the people that I engage with and interact with um, I have a it, it, varying you know very diverse people i don't want to say friends but people in my circle some people are for the eff some people think that um like the da is like a no-go area because of racial issues anc i think all of us agree on that um but uh, some are for eff and they're like yeah no one is perfect you know you know this is a better devil than the other devils that we have um while other people are not even interested in voting at all. Some people are like, what, what's the point? Anyone that I vote for is just going to bring us to the same spot. So what's the point? Uh, while we have people who are like saying the NC fought for us and, you know, let's just keep with them. And um, so they're varying um, opinions in my circle. Some people are like me. Some people are like, let's inform people on what is happening. Let people vote for whichever devil that they choose with the information and the right knowledge to say this is what i'm signing up for um but those closest and nearest to me are on my side to say it's it's a very tough spot that we are in but there is hope uh 2024 might not be the year where this hope is really manifested and comes to light but there's definitely hope. Um, let's keep informing ourselves. Like I said, I don't know much about politics, but now that's like, our, let's know who we're voting for. Let's understand socialism, capitalism, communism, what they're saying and what they have done, uh, what they're able to do and not do. And let's, let's, let's keep praying for this nation. Let's keep praying uh, for a miracle. And I think that's, that's one big thing that we need really for, for hope. We need a miracle. That's where I'm at. I know that we can't just pray and sit down. We're praying and we're taking action. But I think for South Africa to really come out from where it is, we need a serious miracle. That's what we're saying in our circle, in my circle. It's very much what they're saying in all of the circles. I mean, we're one of the these really bizarre kind of countries where the majority of people who pay tax are held hostage by those that don't. And it's kind of like everybody that pays tax votes one way and everybody that doesn't votes another, if you know what I mean. So it's like it's, it's, a, it's a strange old country, which is why the ANC loves creating people that don't pay tax. In other words, unemployed people. Because then they think, well, more votes for us, right? Mm -hmm. 
it's a it's a very strange form of logic it's a it's a it's a logic to keep yourself it's a logic to keep the comrades in uh in power but it's not a logic to to grow the the life and the prosperity of your people and I think if any of us are still believing that the ANC are uh, interested in the prosperity of their people, then uh, you're not paying attention. So, mm. yeah, I think I think we're all hoping for that uh, for that miracle. Mm. But um, you 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 need you need to you need to you need to tell me though from from your perspective. Obviously, you've you've just come into it. You've just started to get in uh, into politics. You said quite a few times like you're not a you're not a big political person. You're just kind of getting into it now. What changed you? Like at some point in time, you were sat there and you like you woke up in the morning. You thought, "I got, a, I got a great idea. Today, I'm not talking about how Jesus is my savior. I'm talking about how Julius Malema is a puss. Okay, that's like that's a massive, that's a massive mind shift change. Like, what happened? Something happened. <laughs> I, I'm tired. I'm tired. Um, the the second child that I told you about is not. He's like just two years old, and the experience was so horrible. Like it, it was traumatic, really. Um, so experiences like that, experiences that we we experience at the home affairs, the corruption, like the bribes that we are made to to pay. You know, in our small circles, in our small lives, we experience incompetence, we experience corruption. Then you get onto the news and you see something else. I never used to watch the news, by the way, because I was like, oh, this is so depressing. This is so depressing. But for how long are you going to avoid it, right? But so I was like, okay, it's happening in our lives. It's happening in every province. It's happening on the national scale. And it's like when you have a friend who annoys you and you keep gossiping about them with your husband or your wife and you, you, you're just gossiping about them, but you don't have the courage to say, hey, man, Byron, I'm like what you said there. Hey, Byron, I'm like what you did there. So I'm, I just got to a place of saying I'm tired of just talking about it. I'm tired of just experiencing it and feeling sad by myself, and I'm going to do what I can. And what started it was when I just checked what some of these politicians were saying, right, and what they were doing and what they were saying and what they were doing was so, you know, it was like polar opposites. And I was like, do people know about this? Do people know that these people are lying like this? I was like, okay, ANC has shown us for a long time that they are incompetent. Why are we still voting for them? And my conclusion was people don't know they think they know not everyone some people don't know what they're actually signing up for and the only way for people to take the right action 2024 2029 and beyond is for them to have the right knowledge like you know uh, my people perish for lack of knowledge and I think it's applicable even in politics. It's applicable even in how we live our lives as South Africans. We are perishing. We are in poverty. We are, you know, being treated like we're not paying uh, the salaries of the people that are mistreating us in hospitals and at the police station at the home affairs because we don't have the right knowledge. So my inspiration was I'm tired of being treated like this and being quiet about it, like I'm just facing a bully that I'm scared of and I'm just going to get up and do something about it, not just for me, but for everyone else who cares to listen. Yeah, and that's such an important thing. Even even for people in our circles who are deemed to be you know, educated and intelligent and got degrees, I mean, if you say the ANC is a communist organization, they still don't believe you. <laughs> Right. Yep. You talk about the National Democratic Revolution. Oh, that's a conspiracy theory spread by mm. the national party. Like, like, no, like all this stuff is real, guys. Mm. They want to take your stuff and not pay you. It is that mm. simple. Mm. And they will impoverish, they really impoverish a lot of the people in this country who aren't uh, minorities, but they're going to come for you next, right? So, uh, you know, we, we tend to have an audience that is based around minorities in this country. A lot of Indians, a lot of whites, a lot of coloreds. And a lot of black as well watch our show. But these oh. tend to be like sort of middle class people. Okay. And every time we make a video about these sort of ideas and the inferences drawn between what does the ANC actually want, people are like, oh, thank you so much for articulating what they want. But look, it's so obvious from their policies what they want. They want to take oh. all your stuff oh. and not pay you for it. That is oh. the baseline for all oh. ANC policy. And it oh. takes and it takes forever for people to realize that. Even the so called, you know, 
educated people. So the more people like you and, and us and, and whoever else wants to join in, knowledge is power, as they used to say back in my day when I was at school. But knowledge is about also using it to make fundamental change. There's no point just having it. You must use it in a material Absolutely. way as well. So yeah, kudos to you and Godspeed is all I can say. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, unfortunately, this is a major problem in uh, South Africa as a whole. People don't understand the political party. And part of that is kind of back to the old 94 whole paradigm of getting the ANC in there in the first place. People forget that prior to 94, the ANC was uh, closely linked with forms of communism. One of the reasons it was banned in the first place is because the world was fighting against the Cold War against the US. And as part of that, uh, or sorry, the US was fighting the Cold War against the Russians. And as part of that, everybody became very anti-communistic. They seem to think that when the Berlin Wall fell in the 90s, that the ANC would dis disabar itself or disavow itself of communist thinking. A lot of people went through to kind of cleanse the party and make it seem more palatable to people. I mean, in doing that, they kind of like, they still have this fake idea of who the ANC were. Now, all we're seeing in 2023 is a lot of those ideas seem to be coming out more and more prevalent. A couple of years ago, there was a political, there's a politician who talked about uh, democratic centralism. And when I talk about a politician, I mean a, a cabinet minister. Now, for anybody who knows anything about democratic centralism, it's a phrase used to, to describe the governance structure of North Korea. So basically it means that like the top like 10 people in North Korea make all the rules and all the laws for the entire place with the overall authority being to the supreme leader. So it's like a lot of people looked at that at the time and they're like, nah, she can't really mean that, can she? I mean, oh, democracy, you know, like democracy and stuff. And it's like, nah, that's exactly what she meant. She meant that... We shouldn't have all these other people kind of being able to tell us what to do. You find this in Becky Seller as well. You know, he, he hates the idea of actually having anybody tell him what to do. It's kind of like he thinks that he should have a degree of, you know, democratic centralism. He's the minister of police. The rest of you can footsack. You, he's the king of police. It's not a minister. He's the king. He's the chief. Mm. Now shut up and do what he says. And unfortunately, when you describe this to most people, they go, nah, that, that can't be true. It's not what they want. And then you just say to them, well, you know, all of these ideas are, are actually listed in a document called the National Democratic Revolution. It was a strategy given to the ANC by the Soviets. They go, ah, oh, that's, that's hogwash. That's, that's not true. All the ANC wants is a democratic, democratic government. So we just want free, free and fair elections. And then Cyril goes on TV tomorrow and talks about how we need to accelerate the democratic revolution into stage two. We need to accelerate the progress of it. It needs to go into overdrive. And you're like, What's that? And he's like, oh, he's just talking about new elections. Must be, right? And so unfortunately, that always leads to this political paradigm in South Africa where, as Roman always likes to say, reform is always just one election cycle away. Everything will get better. It will just, you can wake up tomorrow, there'll be a new dawn. Reform is coming, guys. It's coming. Yeah, it's not coming. It's not, it's not coming unless you make it come. Absolutely. And unfortunately, the only way to make it come is by people like you saying what you're saying, exposing what they're saying behind closed doors that no one else wants to believe. Mm. Unfortunately, no one's really going to believe you on bulk, though, so I'm sure you've already started to encounter that. Yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of people just want... It's like you believed in this person, you know, you believed in the ANC, you believe in democracy and everything that they've promised you and you see yourself as an intelligent person and maybe you are an intelligent person and you're like, but how could I have been lied to? There's no way, there's no way. And for you to acknowledge that actually I've been sleeping, actually I've been lied to, actually I've been very naive for the longest time, it takes a lot, right? Like Because you need to look at yourself and say, how dare I be, you know, so sleepy. And I don't think it's an easy thing for a lot of people to do. I've accepted and acknowledged that it's not easy for someone to say, this person that you've been following for the last 10 years is actually not who he says he is. And yeah, so it, it, it's going to take time also for people to accept the knowledge when it is presented to them. Yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, COVID's taught us that people don't really want to believe that stuff, do they? Uh -uh. I mean, I don't know about you, and I don't, we, we, won't, we don't have time to discuss COVID, but I mean, for me personally, COVID showed me 
that everybody would trust the science, even when the science was bullshit. And now, all this time afterwards, when you sit back and you think to yourself, you know, they made you stay in your home for a year. You couldn't leave your house. Everywhere you went, you weren't allowed to hug your wife in public because, you know, oh. social distancing. Oh. Every store you went into, you had to put bloody hand sanitizer on your hands. You know how bad that is for you? Joints and your skin mm. and all sorts of shit. You used, mm. to, you used to have to wear a bloody face diaper. Yeah. You had to put a nappy on your face. Now when you tell people that, they're like, oh, but it was for COVID. It was for oh. COVID, it's keeping me safe. You're like, dude, did you get COVID? Yeah, I got it twice. It's like, you're not dead yet then, right? So what was the face diaper for? Oh, yeah, but, you know, government told me it was for my health. It's like, so how about just admit you got lied to you? You're like, you got fooled. I told you to do some stupid shit. Yep. They probably all sat there behind a closed door somewhere going, <laughs> uh, do you think we could make them, like, put a face mask on? I bet, I bet you we can't. And they were like, the guy goes on TV, he's like, and, and you must wear a mask. And then everybody did it. And he was like, ah, we, do it. we did it. We did it, guys. But no one wants to admit it. It's like. It's a degree of embarrassment for the whole world. Not just for South Africa, the whole world. Absolutely. No one wants to admit they were conned. Yeah. But on a silver lining, the, 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 the real important bit about South Africa lies with its people. So we look at survey data all the time, and you always see eight out of ten South Africans want the same thing. They want less corruption. They want more jobs. They want a growing economy. They don't care about land. They really care about educating their children properly, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's a pity that ordinary people don't have enough of a voice, <clears throat> excuse me, in South Africa in a general sense. It's dominated by journos and, and politicians. But fundamentally, if we all agree that the average South African very much agrees with every other South African around them and across the nation, that's where the true power lies. We just need to get them to act. Aww. As we have that's, been saying, that's Aww. why morning shots are so important. Because uh, look at this: we've got three people from different backgrounds in different parts of the country, and we're all agreeing on practically everything. Yep. So it shows people that you know what our views aren't that different. They're not. They're not. You just need to come together and work towards that common goal. And that means creating more content. Kalejo, thank you so much for joining us on Morning Shots. We wish you all the very best. On citizen concern, we want you to really throw everything you can at Julius Malema. Tell him stop being such a racist little bastard. That guy, you know, if he became right wing, could be such a force for good instead of a force for evil. Maybe we can convince him. I don't know. But if we can't, we may as well bring him and cut him down to size. And you're doing a phenomenal job at that. So thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Just disclaimer again, it's not just about Julius Malem. It's just that he has so many lies that need to be, you know, dispelled. That's why so much of my content is about him. But yeah, everyone is going to have their turn in time. Thank you guys so much for your time. We look forward to uh, seeing the expo on Morning Shot. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Byron, it's coming. <laughs> <laughs>